Ladies and gents, this is UX and this is Hunting the Bismarck, the pride of Germany, extra history part one by the channel Extra Credits. Y'all know what this is, Hunting the Bismarck, something about the ship, that's what's description. During World War II, the Bismarck was the pride of German Navy. Oh, okay, this is World War II time. And the nightmare of Great Britain. It was enormous, overpower, and a constant threat to the seas. So when they got word that the Bismarck had mobilized the British race to stop it. Okay, so there was a ship in German command that was so terrifying like that. As soon as it got mobilized, everybody was just panicking. Is that it? Why? Why were Nazis like this? I don't. I don't understand that. You know, it's like you know the uh, some villain in games or some villain in the, you know movies or something, some superhero movies. But they always have something really overpowered, which is you know way powerful than anybody, way powerful than anybody else has. And everybody just panics because of it. Nazis always have some equipment, something like that. Oh, Nazis have this and that's way overpowered. Everybody raised to stop it. They, they always sound like some super, super movie, superhero movie villains, always. Let's go this one. Remember, if you like my ricks, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out the Rick Sunday, there's a link in the description. Check out the cars over a different place. Check out the end cards in here. Let's watch it. May 20th, 1941. A restaurant in Stockholm. A British officer, the naval attaché to neutral Sweden, is having dinner alone when the waiter interrupts him with a telephone call from the embassy. His eyes widen. He slams down the receiver and rushes out. Waiting for him at the embassy is a Norwegian colonel, the man Swedish intelligence leaks to when they want information to land in British hands. He has a sighting report from a Swedish cruiser. They relay it to London via encrypted telegram, and it says, at 1,500 hours, two large warships, escorted by three destroyers, five ships, and ten or twelve planes, passed to the northeast. The ships are German, and the hunt is on. Damn, one Bismarck having that kind of effect is ridiculous. This episode is sponsored by Wargaming. Download World of Warships and use the code EXTRA1 for free goodies. Link in the description. The hunt for the Bismarck is one of the most dramatic events of World War II. It's a story of great ships clashing in frozen waters, a tale of risk-taking, heroism, and shocking loss, and the blind luck that- I guess what happened is World War I, obviously British Navy was way too powerful. I guess German realized that and wanted to do something about it in the World War II, when it started like, we can't have, you know, Britain being so overpowered during this time if you want to dominate the world or something. So they came up with technologies like that. But this is ridiculous, right? You know, one ship called Bismarck is terrifying to everybody. Nazis always have equipment like that. Sometimes changes history. So when Wargaming contacted us again saying that they wanted to sponsor a series of episodes on the Bismarck, uh, we jumped on that right away. But what makes the Bismarck story interesting isn't just the ships and the battles, it's the hunt. For the Royal Navy, the biggest problem wasn't sinking the Bismarck, it was finding it. This is a detective story writ large, an international manhunt that stretched from the icy seas of the Denmark Strait to the chattering computers of Black. I mean, yeah, in the end, it's a ship. This is not some game where you could just, you know, scale up the level and it's invincible. It's just ship in the end, doesn't matter how powerful you make it. It's, it's not going to be hard to sink it. But, you know, obviously during the battle, it must be so badass that people were fearing it. So people were thinking, was, you know, to launch specific operations just to sink it. Letchley Park. It will begin with an interrupted dinner and end with the destruction of the largest battleship on Earth. Allow me to set the scene. 21st of May, early morning. A British naval base at Scapa Flow. Vice Admiral John Tovey, commander of the home fleet, is aboard his flagship thinking that this might finally be it. For days, German reconnaissance planes have passed above him, recording the position of his ships. Scapa Flow is a hard station, a barren rock in freezing seas, but it's also strategically crucial real estate. From their base in Scapa, Tovey's fleet guards the watery expanse that stretches between Greenland and Nazi-occupied Norway, and securing that line was the only thing keeping Britain alive. This is a crucial juncture in the war. The previous year, France had collapsed, German forces had occupied Norway and Denmark, and the Italians had entered the war on the side of its fascist ally, Germany. The Axis powers were now masters of Europe, and Britain stood alone, besieged in its own islands. As Luftwaffe raids pounded its cities, American supply convoys... Damn, okay. 
That was really after time, right? Italy and Naz- Italy was with the, you know Nazi occupied Germany. Japan was damn. The Britain was standing there alone. Yeah, th- you know during that time, British people must be under real pressure, right? Because all this shit happening, they already know what happened in World War One. It could have gone bad really during that time, especially when you know uh, Germany was bombing London and different part of Britain in World War One. World War Two, they even scaled it up to I guess eleven. You know, bombed the. Sh- out of the Britain and now all this thing happened where you know Norway everybody's everything's occupied by Germany you know so sooner or later France will fall too that was a real pressure situation at the time in its own islands as Luftwaffe raids pounded its cities American supply convoys were the only thing keeping Britain in the fight this was a tonnage war measured in cargo delivered rather than ships sunk Convoys raced through U-boat infested waters to get Fortress Britain enough food, bullets and oil to defend democracy. Kobe's <laughs> nightmare was of a If sing- Britain falls, I don't know what happens after that, right? Because it's like uh, now, you know, Germany and Nazis have stronghold in entire Europe if, you know, we, we Britain falls. So it was really crucial to make sure Britain doesn't fall because, you know, after that uh, probably Hitler becomes invincible. You know, it's it's really hard to say if he he would ever you know get defeated or not if uh, Britain falls or not. But I'm pretty sure it would be extremely hard now. Single ship, the Bismarck. British intelligence had been building a file on her for some time, even attending her launch in 1939 and monitoring her sea travels via air and signals intercepts. They still didn't know everything. They didn't know how fast she was, her crew complement, or what new technologies she had. But they did know that she was enormous and advanced, outfitted with both heavy armor and 15-inch guns that could sink near anything the Royal Navy could throw at it. But the British also knew that Bismarck was more than a ship. She was a political statement. Hitler had jump-started Germany's economy with public spending, including a focus on military rearmament. The Bismarck was a visible symbol of Germany's economic miracle, a nation with a 100% employment rate, provided you didn't count the Jews and the women forced out of the workplace. Oh, yeah. And at over 40,000... I saw that. You know, I don't know which channel was that. I think it was Armchair Historian, right? I saw that video. Where, oh, I'm going to fix the economy, okay? I'm just going to throw the people who are unemployed into, you know, making my equipments, army and things like that. Yeah, I'm going to, you know, make sure the women are not considered and by making them marry or something if i remember correctly something like that and yeah, jews don't count so he just cut out all the points he could so you know percentage ratio goes up and he did all this shenanigans to make sure the world sees oh look at that german economy is flowing everybody has jobs thousand tons bismarck was also a flagrant violation of post-world war one treaties that limited the size of germany's naval vessels this ship celebrated the nazi success and proclaimed their warlike intentions This was a new Germany, an economically strong Germany that had military ambition and rejected any attempt to restrain it. But so far, this great ship was still bottled up in the Baltic, operating out of ports in northern Germany and occupied Poland. But if the Bismarck could stage a breakout, slip between Denmark and Norway and cut north into the Atlantic, it could plunge down into the Atlantic convoys, a knife straight into Britain's supply artery. Seriously. German raids Ooh, been- shit, that's the point of all this thing, right? Britain needs supplies from the US and everywhere from the you know Atlantic and that's the biggest issue right now. Everybody's just racing to make sure Britain doesn't run out of supplies because if that happens, Britain falls under Nazi occupation and then that's it. <clears throat> I mean, what do you do after that? Everything else is occupied by, you know, Nazi Germany. And now, you know there's such thing as Bismarck, you know, this badass ship. What if just, you know, leaves this area and just start to attack this, all the cargoes, uh, ships and everything? What do you do then? I mean, that would be so effed up. That's why people were panicking. Proved costly, and those ships had only been a quarter the size of the Bismarck. Tovey's phone rings, a direct line from the Admiralty in London. The call passes on the Swedish Navy's sighting, but now it's corroborated with more information. A Polish source reported that the Bismarck left port three days ago, and a Norwegian resistance cell spotted a group of German ships passing between Norway and Denmark. Royal Air Force reconnaissance planes, they say, are currently scouring the fjords. Tovey issues an order to his fleet, refuel and stand by to sail. 13.15 hours in Norway. An RAF pilot cruising the fjords spots and photographs a large ship with a heavy cruiser nearby. Back in Scotland, an analyst confirms the silhouette while the photos are still damp from the darkroom. 
It's the Bismarck, probably with the heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen. The photos confirm Tovey's greatest fear. Worse, Damn. the weather is deteriorating. With fog forecast overnight, Bismarck had probably been hiding in the fjords, waiting for <laughs> just such weather to cover its dash to the Atlantic. Tovey summons his subordinate, Vice Admiral Lancelot Holland, and details his plan. Holland will take his squadron to southern Iceland and Add hold- some name, right? Lancelot Holland. There, staying in a position to intercept the Bismarck, regardless of whether she sails down the east or the west coast of the island. Tovey will stay in Scapa, in case the Bismarck tries to use the foul weather to sneak past the north side of Britain. The cruisers currently patrolling the Denmark Strait would stay on course with orders to spot and shadow the Bismarck, then radio its course so Holland can intercept. Holland's squadron slips out at midnight. 22nd of May, at 0200 hours in Norway. An RAF bombing raid hits the Bismarck's last known position, releasing their payloads blind due to the low clouds. Heavy fog, no sighting. Further reconnaissance flights are <laughs> futile for the next several hours. Twenty hundred hours in the Scapa flow. Admiral Tovey, who has been living next to the phone for the last 24 hours, receives a report from the Admiralty. A daring reconnaissance plane has flown low enough to break through the clouds. The Bismarck is gone. Any further reconnaissance flights are grounded due to poor weather. He orders the command to sail for Iceland immediately, hoping to fill any gaps in their screen. In the 30 hours since the last sighting of the Bismarck, the German raiders could have sailed 600 miles toward the Atlantic access points around Iceland. As Tovey leaves port, he radios Holland to say that Bismarck is heading his way, and that the fleet must maintain radio silence. The Bismarck has slipped through the first net. It must not slip through another. 23rd of May. <laughs> Damn, this is after, right? Oh, we want the Bismarck. Let's bomb it. They blindly bombed the area. Oh, wait a bit. Bismarck left a long time ago. There's nothing there. They just bombed the water, basically. Oh, man. <laughs> Nazis always have this kind of ridiculous technologies, right? This badass ship. In some, you know, some other tank or some, you know, jet fighter. And, you know, people find different plans of Nazi Germany, which they wanted to make if they didn't get defeated. Which was so OP. I mean, it would have changed the war, that kind of OP. I mean, some, you know, I remember watching some channel a long time ago to find the video. But yeah, there were many different plans of ridiculous technology that they, they were already, you know, underway in development. If they had done that, Germany would have been so advanced and OP. It would have been ridiculous. Only Nazi Germany can be like that, right? Of all the time of the previous time, only Nazi Germany can be like this, like, you know, that superhero villain type of thing, where they always have some OP, you know, overpowered thing, and they just stand there as a villain with, you know, massively powered equipments and things like that. 1922 hours, the Denmark Strait. Two sister cruisers have been searching the icy, mine-filled waters of the Denmark Strait for 50 hours, ever since the Bismarck was last spotted, when a lookout sees two ships emerge from a snowstorm. He thinks they're British at first, but a second glance sends him scrambling. It's a German battleship, and only seven miles away, well within the killing range of its 15-inch guns. Action stations sound. The officers below abandon their pre-dinner sherry. Running feet pound the deck. The cruiser turns hard over and makes for the fog, its 8-inch guns useless against the steel behemoth. For three agonizing minutes, the crew waits for incoming shells as their little ship slowly takes cover in the mist. The Bismarck's shells never arrive. Reorienting herself, the <laughs> What the fuck, man? Imagine being at that ship, right? Oh, man, that's Bismarck. Those guns are ridiculously powerful. You know, we literally can't do nothing against this ship. That's how powerful it is. Its range is massive. You know, shells is gonna shoot. It's gonna definitely sink us like that. And, you know, we can't do much about it anyway. And they run away and hide and they just wait for the shells to come. That's a fear situation. I mean, I remember, you know, watching when I was when I was a kid playing Call of Duty or was it IGA? I don't know. There was some old game long time ago where the tanks were too, too terrifying. Right, they were just way open to terrify you. You hear the sound of them; it terrified you. And as a kid, you know, I used to get into the game way too much. So I remember being terrified, just hearing the sound of the tank and just hiding. You know, this feels similar to that. Obviously, it would be you know amplified that by two thousand because this is a real world situation. But imagine being that in the fog. There's a massive German ship there. They could basically sink sink you any time now. 
And you don't know the intention of this ship. What is it doing here? What's its goal? What is it trying to do? Cruiser stalks its quarry through the fog and the rain, deploying its most effective weapon, a sensor array. These cruisers may not have heavy guns, but they are outfitted with advanced systems that allow them to track enemy ships solely by radar, a feat never achieved before. The cruiser uh. radios its sighting reports to her sister ship 15 miles south, who relays it to the rest of the fleet and rushes to join the pursuit. An hour passes. 2030 hours, the Denmark Strait. Over eager and heading at speed, the second cruiser plunges through a fog bank to find itself nearly head on with the Bismarck, six miles away and closing at 30 knots. Her captain orders the helm hard to starboard and deploys a smoke screen, breaking for the mist. This time. <laughs> Imagine that as soon as Fox goes away, you see the you know Bismarck in front of you and it just you know that a cartoon is happening. <laughs> and just suddenly they just deploys a smoke smoke with screen smoke grenade or whatever and just you know you turns it the bismarck is quick on the draw a oh. salvo of 15 inch shells lands behind the vessel's stern rattling it with metal splinters another what shell lands 50 yards short and skips like a stone over the bridge but the cruiser escapes shrouded in mist the twin cruiser <laughs> everybody's like you know launch the nitros launch the nitros and we don't have enough why don't you have nitros <laughs> a little wiser and a bit more careful fall in behind the Bismarck and the Prince Eugen, staying out of sight but within the 10-mile range of their radar arrays, quietly broadcasting Bismarck's position to the fleet. 2100 hours, the interception fleet at Denmark Strait. Admiral Holland's battlecruiser force plunges towards the Bismarck. There are rough seas and snow flurries in the strait, with waves so high that their destroyer escorts are getting submerged and have to pull back. Destroyers will do little good anyway, Holland knows. This will be a two-on-two -two battle of capital ships. At his disposal, he has the newest ship in the British fleet, the Prince of Wales, and his flagship, the pride of the Royal Navy, the HMS Hood. The Hood has been called the most beautiful ship afloat. Between the wars, she had circumnavigated the globe as a symbol of British invincibility. She's the star of fleet reviews and propaganda reels. Many of her crew got their first taste of Navy life by seeing her at holiday parades or through childhood tours of her deck. She is the beloved, the unsinkable, the mighty hood. And she is steaming towards destruction. Join us next time for... Yeah, exactly. I was about to say, you're talking like it's better than Bismarck. No, it's not, right? Bismarck is really OP already. So for, you know, Royal Navy was really good like that, but Bismarck was way too OP than that. Damn. I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? When, you know, uh, you know, <clears throat> Treaty of Paris basically restricted Germany, you know, to create anything, to create army, to create bigger ships and everything. And then they slowly start to do it, do it, do it. They make the biggest fucking uh, ship that is, you know, they create lots of tanks and everything before anybody can realize what they are doing. Damn, Germany really went sneaky in World War II. Just created all this equipment, these powerhouses. That just shows how, you know, uh, extreme Nazis and Hitler was at the time. All right, people, that was hunting the Bismarck, the pride of Germany, by the channel Extra Credits. If you like my next one, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out the Rick Sunday. There's a link in the description. Check out the castle. Please check out the link cards. And I'll see you next time.